Now, if you guys know anything about me, I like travel content. And I don't know if any of you guys have watched any of my travel content. Not a lot of people have. I know it's very different from what I normally do, but I like to go to weird museums. Ripley's, believe it or not. Um, has anybody here done the Meow Wolf experience here in town? Anybody done Meow Wolf? You did Meow Wolf. If you haven't done Meow Wolf and you like art installations, and you just want to be like in another world for a little while, let me describe this experience for you. I'll have a video coming out so you'll be able to see it, but you, you, you go through a portal in a mall, and then once you're inside that portal, you end up in, I think she said it was Illinois, and it's this perfectly normal house. Keep in mind, inside a mall, and inside this perfectly normal house is shit's gone weird, so you start opening up cabinets and stuff, and number one, the family that lives in this place is missing. So it's an alternative reality game. You can try to figure out what happened to the family if you want to. Alternatively, there's creatures and monsters and like otherworldly art exhibits. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. So the point that I'm telling you about this is because I did Meow Wolf and then did Six Flags. It was, <laughs> one cost $40, one cost 100 Fuck Six Flags. Okay, all right. Uh, anybody here who likes uh, haunted house content? You guys, are you crazy about haunted houses? Anybody here? Am I the only? You like being scared? Here's what I discovered about liking being scared. Um, and I talk about this at a lot of my conventions, so I don't mind talking about it here. Um, who here is familiar with my Francis character? All right, most of you. Okay. Do you guys know where Francis came from? Francis came from a variety of different places, but originally, he came from the first time I played Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers, specifically on the NES. Now, I played video games prior to this, like um, any Atari 2600 game. Do we have any Atari 2600 fans out here? No. <laughs> we found the one guy. Are you blind, sir? Because there's only like eight pixels. He just likes pretty colors. He doesn't care, he just, he's happy. <laughs> Once it's just flashing on the screen. That was me, though, growing up. I'm like eight years old, I'm playing E.T. and Indiana Jones and, and, and Adventure. Adventure was the first RPG I ever played. It was, I actually couldn't figure out what the hell was going on because I didn't know that Arrow was a sword. I, you need to look this game up if you haven't seen it. Um, anyway, I graduate to the NES and I'm now old enough to where I understand the concept of video games a little bit better. Run to the right, jump on the thing, beat the level, right? It's not just a thing I do because I'm four and it's pretty, right? Um, and so I'll never forget, I take a trip down to Florida and I had finally got to World 8-1 on Super Mario Brothers. And back then, by the way, we, we just couldn't look up on the internet how to beat a game. You had to figure it out. And if you were lucky, there were some kids in your neighborhood who also had that game, who's also played it, and they can tell you, oh my god, I found a warp world in, in World 1, 2, and that makes, you know. Eventually, Nintendo Power existed. RIP Nintendo Power. Um, <laughs> that would give us some clues, right? But I worked hard to get to level A1. That was not a, a, an easy achievement for my 10-year-old brain. Yes, I was 10 when the NES came out. So I died and did not know that you can continue with Super, in Super Mario Bros. Did you guys know that, that game has a built-in continue? I know it now. I didn't know it at 10. I just thought that meant I was going back to World 1. And I threw that controller across the room and I went, fuck! And that's the day I realized I was Francis. Now, throughout high school, um, and this is a little darker area, I don't normally talk about this in a lot of YouTube videos. I say this for conventions and stuff, but in high school, I was very much my character Francis. I don't like to admit that, but it's true. I would smash a controller from time to time. I was also pretty famous for smashing my head into the wall when I got frustrated. <laughs> Uh, I, I once picked up a desk and I got in trouble for reading a Stephen King book in during class. Which honestly, if you're, listen man, if you're reading 
and you get in trouble for reading? What has happened to the world? Okay, anyway, so I picked the desk up and I threw it across the room, classic Francis stuff, right? And later in life, I realized I just don't get to feel emotions like other people do. I have to like kind of be very careful with my emotions because I'm a very sensitive young girl. <laughs> I have, I feel all the things, man. You know, I feel when I am sad, oh, am I sad. When I am angry, ooh, am I angry. When I'm in love, oh, I fall so hard. Um, and when I'm scared, see, I'm bringing it back. This makes sense. When I am scared, I am so scared. It's insane. But when you go to a haunted house, it's like filming a Francis video for me. For one brief three minute moment, you know you're safe, but it's still scary. You get to feel scared in a safe environment. Same as a smash room. Is there any smash rooms here in Dallas? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Rage rooms, smash rooms? You get to be very angry for 30 minutes in a safe environment. How amazing is that? So I was experiencing these things and then I just found out that's actually just what therapy is. I, <laughs> I thought therapy was just like sit around and talk about your feelings and shit. But no, it's a place to feel your feelings in a safe environment. Here I was abusing haunted houses <laughs> and rage rooms as my therapy. Well, I tried real therapy. Recommend it. Uh, I do, it's, it's nice. I think probably I'm the sanest I've ever been. Now, you know, that's like saying this car has been wrecked today. It's the least wrecked it will ever be. <laughs> I'm probably never gonna be sane, I like to think. I think I'll always be a little bit crazy. I like being a little bit crazy. Who here is a little bit crazy? Yeah, it's nice being a little bit crazy, isn't it? It's fun. I mean, let's be honest, okay? If you're spending your Saturday at a retro gaming convention, hunting for that mint and box version of Little Samson, okay? <laughs> we are not that well adjusted. If someone was sitting in this room right now thinking to themselves, you know what, I may own 800 video game cartridges, but by God, I'm normal. I have news for you. <laughs> We're all a little bit weird. And there's something beautiful about that. You know my favorite thing about conventions are, I mean obviously I like to entertain, and I like to sit up here and have a captive audience of 50 people to sit here and listen to me full of, be full of shit. That's great, right? And I love seeing, uh, oh this one specifically, I get to see um, my favorite people. I get to see Jay and Billy, are my Game Chaser fans in here? And look who else is there, 8-Bit Eric, he's also here for some reason. And, uh, but then Pro Jared is here. I haven't seen Pro Jared since he got canceled and then got uncanceled. Congratulations, Pro Jared, on that. Woo, who does that? It's like him and Louis C.K., those are the two people that came back from it. Good job. Um, and then, but my favorite thing is just being in a room full of weirdos like me. It's just great. How great some of us are probably on various different spectrums, and that's fun. And some of us just, there are, I'll admit, some well-adjusted people that I meet at these things, and they just have one thing in common with the rest of us, which is we all just love a thing. We love a thing. We love the, our childhood. We love the games that we played. We love the, the characters that we fell in love with. We love, how amazing is it to come to something like this and be in love with something together. That's amazing. You go to a sports game, half the people there are mad. Fuck sports, I don't go to sports. And don't get me wrong, some of us love to hate video games, all right? But you, it's still a passion. I love just being in a room full of passionate people celebrating their passion. I'm just so glad to do that with you guys here today. So, that said, I love your cosplay, by the way. You look great. Um, so, I like to do a Q&A. They told me I have to get, uh, 
I gotta keep it a little tight today, but I like to do a little bit of Q&A. Here's everything I know a little bit something about, okay? And you can ask me about anything. I'm an open book. I know what it's like to be uh, 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 overweight, so we can talk about obesity issues if you want to. I'm entirely okay with that. I've been playing video games since 1978. My first gaming console was the Atari 2600. If a game existed, I probably played it, so we can talk about any video game console, any video game system. I've also been doing social media from TikTok to Instagram Reels to YouTube Shorts to YouTube itself, but on top of that, I've been making internet content since 1998. I've seen so much change in the 30 years I've been doing this. If you have any questions about just anything, hell, if you want directions to where you park your car, I'll help you find it. I don't really give a shit. Uh, raise a hand. Anybody got a question for me today? Somebody? Uh, right in front row. Heard about what? The U of the Engine. I have heard good things. Okay, so he's talking about the Unity engine, and um, they're trying to retroactively, that was originally a free engine, wasn't it? And now if you've got over 200,000 uh, downloads for your game, uh, they want how much did you say? 20 cents per, per install. Oh my god, that's going to destroy some indie developers, right? Because there's a lot of games that get downloaded, but nobody spends any money on it. A lot of games that are made in the Unity Engine were given away for free. Are they accounting for that? Good lord. Here's the, th here's the thing about gaming companies right now. I don't know if you guys know this. Let's just be honest. I think it's okay to be honest from time to time. We live in an evil world, right? And there's a lot of evil people out there. And every once in a while, um, evil people are gonna are gonna win like that. I think this is evil. Could you imagine giving away your game engine, telling indie developers you can learn on our platform, you can figure it out. We're gonna we're gonna teach you how to code. You can create your first game. Your first game could be free because our engine is free. And then to turn around and ask that kid who's programming out of his bedroom for twenty cents per install over two hundred thousand, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. That's an evil thing. Oh, no, no, Microsoft will fight it, right? Yeah, I mean, so I'm a huge Wizards of the Coast fan. Anybody here ever played Dungeons and Dragons? i a big D&D fan. Uh, so D&D had something very similar happen to this, and I feel like we're going to see more of this cropping up, but Dungeons and Dragons was a dying game in the 90s, right? I grew up playing it in the 80s. Um, it was originally made in like 1971, I think the original books were published in. Uh, don't quote me on that. But I played it throughout the 80s and a little bit in the early 90s. And then the mid-90s, this game called Magic the Gathering came out. Every Dungeons and Dragons group broke up so they could start shuffling cardboard together instead. Um, and so D&D was a bit of a dying game, especially as we approached the early 2000s. And they decided, look, we don't want this game to die. We're going to give away the D20 system for free. So if you're, the D20 system is you roll a D20, that's my charisma, that's my what. Roll D20 to do your checks and stuff like that. It's all based around the D20. They created an open license that allowed anybody to write a book based on that system. And it would cost you no money. You would automatically get approved. You can make whatever game system you want. You can make a supplement for Dungeons and Dragons. You can make your own gaming world using that D20. And the game flourished because everybody is now publishing these D20 rules. And I had a friend, and we ran this campaign, um, Dungeons and Dragons style, where I had a gunslinger because they had published like modern guns and modern weapons under the D20 system, so we knew how much damage they should do. We just imported a gunslinger into Dungeons and Dragons. I was playing Roller of the Shane from, uh, from uh, uh, the Gunslinger series, right? The Dark Tower series. So it was an incredible time for the game. 
And then not too long ago, they decided, they saw all of this money that's being made by these companies like Critical Role, or any Critical Role fans in the house, excellent podcast, excellent game, incredible products. I bought a lot of their miniatures at this point, they're fantastic. Also, the Amazon series they have, ooh, so good. Gotta watch it. Anyway, uh, they retroactively decided that they were gonna start charging people for this open license. Well, they probably would have won in court. That's the fucked up part about it. I mean, the people with money in this country have the power and that company has a ton of money because I have bought so many magic cards. Did I mention they also public Magic the Gathering? Oh my God, if you ever donated a dollar to me on Twitch, I spend it on magic cards, okay? I want to buy magic cards right now. Oh, oh my God. You think, I, you think what I did with food is bad? Wait till you see my garage. It's filled with bulk magic cards from 30 years ago. God help us all, okay? I'm a hoarder. Thank God what I hoard is that big around, okay? Thank God. Anyway, uh, they would have won, but they ultimately backed down due to public outcry. And, and that's what I think is so important that you guys understand, right? So many of you guys probably don't waste your time on social media tweeting about everything you hate all day, right? There's probably one or two of you in the room, uh, me, uh, but, <laughs> but you know, most of you are probably well adjusted enough to leave social media the hell alone, which is a good thing. Bo Burnham, one of my favorite comedians, any Bo Burnham fans in the room, he says that if you can live a life without performing on social media, you should. Let everybody else be the performers. You just live your happy life, right? Don't let anybody else judge you. Don't put yourself out there for anybody else to judge. You be your own judge. Love yourself, right? I love Bill Burton. But it is important when companies like this do evil shit that you let your voice be known. Finally log back into that Twitter account and send some hate mail to that company. Post about it on your Facebook. Whatever social media you use, punish these companies when they do this evil shit um, because that's what ultimately gets them to back down. When they look at the bottom numbers and they realize the public outcry is worse than any amount of money they're gonna make, they'll shut the fuck up and change their mind. It's the only thing that counts in this country is how you spend your money. And as a consumer, you, I'm telling you, I, together, I mean, together in this room, we probably don't have a million dollars between us, but if we did, we'll never be rich, but we can make a difference when we all decide you know, what we feel is right and wrong. And I, I hope that you guys remember that. I think, it's, I think it's amazing. So fuck the people at Unity for pulling that shit. I can't believe that shit. Fuck those guys. Good question, though. Uh, what about you? You had a question earlier? Yeah. Um, yeah. How do I prevent myself from being online? What's it like to be able to So, in retrospect, when it came to YouTube, I overshared. Um, and I think, I think I'm glad that I shared at the level I did because I've been told a lot of times it really helped a lot of people. And if I helped you, I'm like, it makes my life, man. It, even if all I did was keep you entertained for an hour um, during a dark period of your life, that's great. But if I could at least serve as a good example, that's amazing. If I could serve as a bad example, I'm happy with that. You know, the reason I got on YouTube was to serve as a bad example. Here I was, 35 years old. 600 pounds, stuck in my home, no friends, no family, I, I had nothing. And I thought, I'll get on YouTube and I'll make a clown out of myself because I like attention, you know, I'm, I'm wired that way. And people will see what my life has become and I can say, hey, don't fuck up the way I did, right? Um, so I'm glad I overshared in that regard, but for my mental health, it has been real bad. <laughs> uh, I do think it's kind of, again, nice that I was able to share my lows online because I, I know it helps other people feel less alone when they're at their lows. But there's some real sharks on the internet, man. And when they find that blood in the water, they go in and they go in hard. And I don't know what makes people like that. I don't really understand like why someone wants to like get all up in the shit of like some 40 year old man in Arkansas tweeting about video games. Like, why are you upset at that guy? I don't get it. But they sense that weakness um, and they, they, they go in and they, they hammer it and hammer it and hammer it and hammer it. 
And I'm like, what are you, what are you doing in your free time, dude? Like, like get a job, get a hobby, get something. Like, what, how are you spending your time? But I will say one thing. I did say depression is a weakness there. And I think it's perceived as a weakness. But I'm going to be honest with you. And I don't necessarily mean me when I say this. I know some of you out there are dealing with depression or ADHD or, or uh, hell, I met somebody with schizophrenia not too long ago. And I imagine a good number of us are somewhere on the autism spectrum, right? Um, but I think if you wake up every day and you have to mask because you're autistic or you have to mask because you have depression or you have to mask and, and come across as a healthy, normal person to keep down that job, or to, to, to keep your family off your back or whatever it is you're doing. I think if you wake up every day and you battle your brain the moment you wake up, I think you're a fucking warrior. I think there's a bunch of normies out there who don't do that every day and they're living a life that they take for granted when some of you who are struggling have to wake up every day and get your mind right first. That's some bullshit that you have to do that. That's some bullshit. But if you're doing that, I think that gives you incredible strength. And I don't know, I love you for it. I think anybody in here is fighting this stuff, you don't have to raise your hand, I don't wanna know, but a little bit of love. Can we give a little bit of love to the people out there struggling? Come on. Yay. Yay. But that said, uh, social media is, man, if you can strike the right balance, I did not. Um, or if you're a sociopath like Keemstar, <laughs> you're just built for it. That dude's a shark. Did anybody know? Uh, I hate to bring it up. <laughs> but you guys see me get my ass beat in London? Everybody see? Oh, you saw that? Ooh. So let's talk about that. Let's get that out of the way because I got I to gotta earn my self-respect back here in Texas. How many people here has been punched in the face by a 400-pound man? So you have, me and you, we're the two people, okay. It hurts, don't it? It is not a pleasant experience. And I'll tell you, it wasn't like this, he broke a bone or stung my face or anything like that. It was the ricochet. It, my brain went like that, hit the back of my skull, and I was immediately dazed. I was like, wow. I've been hit a few times. I got hit at, down in Houston when I was uh, hanging out with the boys. I got hit back at home a few times. Had a friend punch me in the face with the gloves on. I'm like, I'm ready for this. I was not ready for that. Woo! So I went directly into survival mode. And I just thought, I know I can take a beating. I just want to make it through however long, three minutes. If I can make it three minutes and I don't hit the ground, I'll be happy. Well, in about a minute and a half, uh, that ref, who I was very mad at at the time, <laughs> saved my life, I think. Because <laughs> I went back and watched that tape and I was like, I was dying, like Jordy was ready. Well, so here's the worst part about that fight. I went to uh, the locker room afterwards and Jordy's getting his gloves cut off. And I'm like, good job, Jordy, you rocked my fucking world. He goes, I can't believe the beating you just took. And I'm like, I can't believe it either. That was incredible, I feel so alive. This is the, one of the best moments of my life, you know? And he's like, I I'm like, you, I had no chance out there, did I? And he goes, I couldn't lift my arms. Really? He goes, yeah, I was so tired. I couldn't punch you another time. I was done, man. That was what our entire strategy was, was to let him wear himself out in a minute and a minute and a half, knowing I could take a beating and then hopefully throw a few punches back. Well, I'll have you know, I landed one punch. Yeah! So I can officially say, that not only am I a prize fighter, but I hit a guy. And that check cleared, <laughs> so I got paid to do it. Yeah. Now, a lot of people have asked me if I will ever step back in the ring, and the answer is, how much money you got? Because <laughs> $10,000 is a lot of money, but not worth risking your life over, I think. And until I was in that ring, I didn't realize actually what was at stake. It took up to two hours before that fight, before the, the doctors in England finally signed off on me. They were not gonna let me fight. 
Like you could do permanent damage to your neck, permanent damage to your spine, uh, your bone density is too low, uh, your MRI didn't look that good. They're like telling me I can't do this, I can't do this. I'm like, well, I'm fucking going to. I'm going to walk out of that ring. You want to tell me to not fight with it? Yeah, they, they let us do it. It was a good time, though. It was a good time. Thank you for those of you who watched that. Um, thank you for tuning in on that. That was a, one of the best experiences of my life, and I want to got to do it if it wasn't for you guys. Thank you. All right, any, any questions on this side? We got any questions? How about you, right there? Ooh, dude, I'll get shirtless right now for 20 bucks. I don't really. <laughs> uh, he's referring to uh, Rich from Review Tech USA, who, if you are not familiar with this, I'm going to educate you about internet culture for a little bit. I am uh, what they call, uh, and I don't mind owning this at all. People are confused when I say this about myself, but I'm in a demographic called the lol cows, right? And uh, the general idea of what a lol cow is, number one, we're somewhere on the autism spectrum. I got diagnosed earlier this year to find out that I'm on the autism spectrum. Uh, number two, we tend to be not the most attractive people in the world. I'd like to think in the lol cow uh, genre, I'm one of the better looking ones, which is to say, you know, still very ugly. But some of the lol cows are uh, considerably less attractive. You know, some of us look like it would be painful for us to breathe, let's just be honest, right? Um, and then the third thing is we react to shit. So, you know, like this morning on Twitter, I checked Twitter and somebody's like, you dating a 12 year old. Now I should obviously ignore that, I'm dating an adult, right? But my brain says, actually she's 20. That's what a low cow does. You can milk it. You can milk that drama. Now one of my favorite, uh, low cows on the internet is Rich from Review Tech USA. And Rich went through a, a very painful divorce. He didn't talk a lot about it, but he went through some shit. And he decided to fully embrace his low cow status. So he like strokes his cock, I should say chicken. Strokes his bird. <laughs> it is a chicken, it's just a chicken statue. He strokes his chicken statue while being shirtless on live stream, and that's what he does on YouTube now for a living. And it's great. And every time I get on the show with him, he's like, let's get our tits out, because we can for some reason, and it is just the most entertaining time. Oh, and then of course Camelot, who, uh, Camelot335, the guy who, if you've ever seen one of his videos, is the one that went viral about how he has no friends. Did you guys see this thumbnail? Most people didn't click on the video. If you click on the video, it's actually kind of wholesome. Right? But the thumbnail makes it sound like, this dude's got no friends. <laughs> of course, I did that too. Uh, I, I may have posted one that said I was rich at one point and people took it out of context. That's what the internet does, but yeah, all three of us getting our shirts off. Here's the problem though. Camelot's ripped, dude. He's a good looking, d I don't want to be naked around somebody that hot. It's bad enough having to walk through this convention with Billy. The, uh, you know, I, I have B Billy Game Chaser. I have a man crush on Billy. He came pick me up at Six Flags last night. I was like, let's go back to your room. Mm. Mm. Billy's a handsome boy. You know who I did not like being naked around? Do you guys know Wood from Be Woods from Beat 'em Ups? One Retro Palooza five years ago. This is back before Woods really blew up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they naked wrestled in, at, the, at the end of day panel, which they used to do. It's gotten too big now, it'd be out of hand. But they used to put every creator up on an end of day uh, Sunday panel. And it was normally just like a way to decompress and to be alcohol and, and silliness going on. And was it Wood and Eric that wrestled naked? Yeah, they were in their underwear, dude. I, I can't believe, I was hot. I was conflicted, man. Oof. Not that there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> okay, you had a question. Oh, no, no, go ahead. So, World of Warcraft for me is an addiction. And uh, I started originally 1996, 
maybe it was 98, this game came out called EverQuest. Any EverQuest fans in here? Okay, wow, we found the two other people that are alive that played that game. Go on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And w what server were you on? Oh, okay. So, original, original EverQuest comes out, and if you could ever Google this game, you'll wonder how it looked immersive. But remember, I played Adventure on the Atari for fuck's sakes, okay? So, it was a first-person MMORPG, and it was largely one of the earliest MMORPGs, but certainly one of the first first-person ones, and it was extremely immersive, right? Um, to travel from one side of the continent to the next side of the continent would generally take you like an hour and a half. It was, it was, um, it was a big world, and it was populated with other people. And there's obviously like dungeons and stuff as well, but the real experience for EverQuest was the social aspect. You couldn't do anything in that game alone. If you were a warrior, you needed someone to heal you. If you were a healer, you needed someone to tank. And if you were a rogue, you were just gonna be looking for group for a long time. But eventually someone would pick you up. And I quit everything. I had a small business that I was doing web design in my local area, creating websites for small businesses. And I mean, good money back then, like 500 bucks to put your website up, it was good money. Um, I just stopped doing it because EverQuest existed. I started playing EverQuest. I played EverQuest for 36 hours straight once. I didn't sleep for a day and a half. We ended up going almost all the way to 48 hours before I finally slept, all to try to get a Rubicite breastplate. That's how much of a nerd I am. Hi, Eric, I love you. Pete's with you too. I love you. Um, anyway, so another game rescued me from EverQuest. It was called World of Warcraft. You can just join me if you want to. I love you guys. Um, well, here's the problem with World of Warcraft. I either play it and only it and only do that, or I don't do anything. That's it. I'm only one guy. The only game that I ever really played that I guess I could say was an online RPG was RuneScape when it first came out. Oh, yeah. And the only reason why I did that was because it was I was in high school, 02, 03. Oh, yeah. And I was one of those kids that didn't do shit at school, so I just played on RuneScape. But to answer, to answer the question a little more succinctly, I cannot play World of Warcraft. Because if I do, I will be 600 pounds again, and I will never leave the house, and I will never do anything. I, it's not even that good. It's like, it's like asking me, like, hey, is McDonald's that good? No, but I'm still going to eat the shit. Oh, dude, can we get McDonald's for lunch? No. Or is it permanently gone? But I do love it. I do. Are you playing World of Warcraft right now? No. You're right, yeah, it's fascinating. And I also really like the idea of, like, the retro servers as well, but... I don't know. There was a guy, the guy who invented EverQuest, Brad McQuaid. Does anybody know that name? You wouldn't, right? But Brad McQuaid, he... Do what? Oh, yeah, John Smedley as well. He went on to make Rift and stuff too, yeah. Um, but Brad McQuaid passed away a few years ago. And when, with Brad's passing, I realized we're never going to have another EverQuest again. World of Warcraft now is some casual shit. It's the McDonald's of MMORPGs. You show up. You, you farm your pets, you solo the raid dungeon, you, you know, and, and nobody talks, nobody interacts with each other. That's what I missed. That's what the fun of those games was for me. I couldn't relate. No, I was just a lonely fat guy. Can't relate to that. I mean, you're a short Mexican who's skinny. You're still a lonely fat guy. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey. Less fat, though. I'm I, more charming. I don't know. You know, me and my girlfriend have been living together for the last three months now. That's the longest a woman is. She's right there in the back. You want to wave at her? Hi. Hi. Um, we've been living together now for three months, which is the longest a woman's put up with my shit in a long time. It's good. And you know what the weirdest part about it is? She still likes me. Right? I often feel like there's this quote. Anybody here watch a TV show called Bojack Horseman on Netflix? I've seen it. Okay, it's incredible. I, we just finished it. We were, I, I had to show it to her for the first time. It's like my eighth watch. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite show. Uh, because originally, Bojack Horseman is this retired um, 
TV actor who hasn't really done anything since he was famous uh, on TV for a while. Kind of like this YouTuber, you know, yeah, who was famous say, once, nice. right? And so it's extremely relatable because all he does is sit in his house and drink and waste away. So what you're saying is you should your next shirt should be like a boogie version of Bojack. Oh, Bojack, right, yeah. Uh, so, like, so watch the show. And at the beginning of the show, I'm like, oh my god, I'm Bojack. And by the end of that show, I'm like, holy shit, he did things I would never, oh my, never. Ne it's kind of like Breaking Bad to the regard of like, at the beginning, you're like, I love Walter White. I really like this guy. And by the end of it, you're like, fuck him. I can't wait to watch him fucking die. The same thing by the end of Bojack. You just, I mean, I still love the character, but he's horribly flawed. Um, no, do you want to? I know. Yeah, they told me, they said, you have to end five minutes early because Pat's so sexy and important. Dude, I'm jealous that you had your panel in here because I had mine, like, the I, I couldn't have the, walked there, that's why mine was here. It was literally, like, the Fellowship of the Ring to get to, like, <laughs> the Eye of Sauron and shit to just get to that panel room. Dude, we went to uh, Six Flags last night, and I walked four and a half miles, which is a lot for me, and I literally could not make it to the Sheridan right now. Are you sore right now? Yeah, I have a walker in my trunk, and I almost broke it out this morning. You didn't use it. I almost brought it out. And you have a basic I didn't use it last night. When I picked you up last night, yeah. I think you knew it was like you just took a shower. You were so oh, yeah. So, you know, like, okay, so here's another true story about me. When I was 600 pounds, I never sweated. Because it didn't do anything. You don't sweat in your air-conditioned recliner while eating McDonald's. If you're sweating doing that, you're dying, right? But now that I have to actually get up and move, I sweat like a pro, dude. That's good. And, like, literally, like, I, I saw, like, five or six fans at, at Six Flags last night. And they'd walk up to me and be like, oh, dude, can I get a photo? I'm like, of course. And they put their hand on you like this and they're like, ugh. <laughs> And, and I just pretend I was on the rapids ride. I was like, oh yeah, we just got we just got off that water ride. Why is my hair not wet? Fuck you. Uh, but seriously, like I get home to the hotel and I wring out that shirt. Oh, it's so amazing. Otherwise, that shit would be He would. He will do anything for money. He needs 20 bucks so bad. Woo! Alright, you can ask Eric questions here too. He's, he's oh, here. No, don't but ask me. Uh, you have a question for me? Did I have the easel up here? What's up, my man? Oh, okay. <laughs> What's up, my man? Good to see you again. So I have, this is the tenth retro palooza he pointed out, and I have come to nine of these things. Um, it, the very first convention I ever got invited to was Retro Palooza, and they asked me like, what's your buy-in rate? I'm like, I just wanna be there. Oh, give me a room to sleep in, that's all I care about. And uh, I, I spent two days here shaking hands and meeting people. And There's been some really great moments. I got to meet some really great creators. I, 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 Billy Mitchell, which is not the first person comes to great creators, but I'm glad to have met him. Um, angry video game nerd, I got to meet him. What an incredible experience to meet AVGN. I, I got to meet some incredible voice actors and actresses. Uh, but I think, God, I always, I hate to cheat. This sounds like a not true answer, but the true answer is I just love meeting everybody, man. Like, it's just meeting you guys, like hanging out with you guys at my booth or like, uh, you know, uh, doing this panel and stuff. It's just, it's amazing to put a face to the people that I've been talking to and entertaining for the last 17 years I've been doing YouTube. Not insane, since 2006 is when I made that channel. And so it's just, it's, a, it's incredible to see the impact I've had in your all's lives and it's, it's incredible to see uh, at the very least that I've entertained or also seeing Billy and Wood naked was nice. I was actually gonna ask if you like that moment. That is, we were just talking about that before you came in. Were y'all here for that when they made like underwear? He was, he was. You can see that smile on his face is like, it was the best day of my life. Dude, at first I was like, what the hell is going on? Then I remembered that this vendor, they were making people do dares for like 
games and like discounts. Yeah. And stuff. Oh, that's so good. So it, it, at first I was like frozen. I was like, what the hell is going on? And then I was like, oh, it's bit. Yeah, of course it's bit. I will say, AVGN. I've got to hang out with him just a little bit, and uh, it's fascinating the person he is in real life. Um, because, and I hate to shit talk anybody, I'm not, don't take this shit talking, uh, but when I met him for the first time, I, I kind of thought I was a big deal. And I thought since we kind of occupy similar space, he would recognize me, right? He did not recognize me. I was just some guy. And that was fine. Who cares, right? Um, but then, he felt bad about that, I think, so they had me fly out to too many games and do his convention there. And while we were out there, I got to spend a little bit of time with James Rolfe. And James Rolfe, as a person, is kind of so introverted, it's difficult to get him to communicate or talk or exist. And so, like, if you're talking to James, he's just going like this. He's going, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. You can tell he's trying to get the fuck out of it. It doesn't matter who he's talking to. Until he has Rolling Rock in him, yeah. and he is a whole. We went to this German bar, and they did something called Das Boot. Does yeah. anybody know what that is? I was there for one of these. Yeah, that was California. Yeah, yeah, that was South Southwest SoCal. Yeah, and so he, they are doing this. They're doing this Das Boot thing, which I do not recommend. It encourages you to drink to unsafe levels. Please don't do that, right? But that's the only way James will talk to people. And after he had about half a boot in him, he was, chatting. He was the greatest person ever to hang out with. It was insane. And then the next day he went back to it. Yeah, I got drunk with him a couple years ago at too many games in yeah, Philly. Yeah. Um, we were up outside the hotel, outside until 8 a.m. drinking. Me, him, and like one other person. Because once you get started with him, he's still. Oh, yeah, he yeah, did until, until somebody passes out. <laughs> he's a good guy. I'm going to go. Real quick, I just want to say I'm super proud. I love you, Eric. I'm proud super of you. Super proud of this guy. He's come a long way. Thank you, Eric. Great. I love you, Eric. Um, and uh, yeah, big things happen from. I'm going to go to the table. I'll be there. Okay. Eric, so, I don't know if you guys know this, but Eric has become one of my favorite human beings on the planet. And I'm proud to call him a friend. And you should watch his content. Oh, I got a little head kiss. That's my, that's my post-con cookie. Yeah, it's like she melt the chocolate chips. Mm. Now I do think, we're gonna, we're gonna do, I, cause they record this, right? They're recording this in the back. So this will be for you, Billy, if you see this later, okay. There's two different movies our community has made. One is the Angry Video Game Nerd movie, and one is the Game Chasers movie. Now, I have a favorite, but let's see by round of applause whose movie you prefer. Do you prefer the Angry Video Game Nerd movie? Clap if you do. Who here prefers the Game Chasers movie? Yeah! Woo, that's some good shit! I, they, I, I don't know if they're doing a showing of it here. Has anybody seen, you guys have obviously seen the movie, right? We're all huge Game Chaser fans in here. I'm, yeah, yeah, that's the one, right? And so I, I like, I, I helped fund that thing. I threw him a thousand bucks, man. I'm just like, don't do that. That's insane. So, so I see, I see those on TV. And like, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, he, they crowdfunded it, but they might have ended up selling it to Tubi. But if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it because I went to a showing of it. The not not the premiere, but like a premiere at a convention, like an early one before you could even get a hold of the DVDs. And I'm like watching that, and we're like 15 minutes in, and I'm like, oh shit, this is like a real movie. At no point did I say that about the Angry Video Game Nerd movie. <laughs> At the entire Angry Video Game Nerd movie, I was like, this is a thing James made. And I'll tell you what the difference was. I'm not shit talking James as a filmmaker, because James is an incredible filmmaker. I mean, we all grew up watching AVGN, right? We love it, we watch it still to this day. Um, what I will say is I think his decision to go out to Hollywood and do it the Hollywood way did not serve him. But the way the Game Chasers made their movie here with their friends and their family and the people they were passionate about, the people they loved and trusted, I think that's what made it a better movie. 
Both great movies. I watch them both all the time. They're both fantastic. But uh, ABGN one just didn't land, and I got dangerous moves. All right, well, let's see. We got time for. As much as I love you, buddy. Oh, you heading out too? Thank you. I love you, Pete. That's food. There's food. You'll get a question for me, Blue? Blue shirt? What you got for me? Come up, you can use the mic too if you don't mind. I want to make sure I hear you. Yeah, so I was looking at a tweet back in February. You said, this tweet goes out to the man who invented boneless chicken wings. Go fuck yourself. And I thought to myself, what well, what would it be like if Francis were to rant about boneless wings? Yeah, okay, all right, all right. Uh, so many food-related things I gotta talk about right now, okay? All right, it is not a chicken wing if it doesn't have the bone in it. Then it's just a chunk of chicken. I don't care if the meat came off the bone. What are you, five? Okay, you, you're done with dino nuggies once you turn 20, for fuck's sakes, okay? All right, okay. Listen, 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 okay? My major food gripe is very simply corn dogs. And it comes down to this. The stick is not part of a corn dog, motherfuckers. I've heard people say that the corn dog has to have a stick in it to qualify as a corn dog. No, it's in the name! Corn dog! That means it's a hot dog wrapped in corn meal. It's not called a stick corn dog, not a corn stick dog, not a dog stick corn. It's a fucking corn dog, and here, here, here now I know, okay? They're a miniature! Corn dogs in your freezer section. Now, if the stick is part of it, where the hell are the miniature sticks? <laughs> also, Chicago style pizza is just a souffle. Go fuck yourself, Chicago. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> we got time for one more. What you got for me, man? All right, so who here has never played Magic the Gathering? Okay, anybody here not play? You haven't played it. Everybody else played a little bit? Oh, wow, okay. All right, so Magic the Gathering originally was called Deck Master, right? It's on the back of the cards, and it was a game system similar to GURPS or the D20 Dungeons Dragon system, where you could put anything into it. If you wanted space cards, you could have space cards. You wanted vampire cards, you could have vampire cards. This was a, a rule system. The first expansion, the first game under that license was Magic the Gathering. Well, they never did anything else with the Deck Master's license except one shitty game that was popular in Japan called Deck Master, which wasn't as fun as Magic, right? So, five years ago now, God, I'm old. Five years ago, they announced that they were going to do something called Universes Beyond, and they were going to involve other properties in the game. Has anybody here ever watched a show called The Walking Dead? The Walking Dead was the first crossover. They got Walking Dead cards. You can play Rick, steadfast leader, in Magic the Gathering. You can play everybody's favorite, Daryl Dixon, even those cards sucks for some reason, um, in Magic the Gathering. And the internet lost its mind. I was not particularly fond of having a Negan card in the game, considering some of the things Negan got up to in the comic books, less so in the show. Um, it was kind of weird to sit across the table from a Negan card, but you know, hey, it's fine. Well, later on, they did a uh, Godzilla crossover, right? Then they did Transformers. And by the time the Transformers one rolled around, I'm like, well, this is just how it is now. I, I don't want to play with a Transformers card. I don't want to play against the Transformers card. <sighs> but it's just part of it now. They had a Fortnite one. Oh, that's cringy. Mm, there's Fortnite cards in Magic the Gathering now. Only like five. There was also Arcane from League of Legends, the TV show. They did a crossover with that as well. Uh, but then, in this last two years, they really 
picked it up a little bit. They did some Dungeons & Dragons crossovers, Forgotten Realms, Baldur's Gate, both pretty decent. Not, not a great cards, but the flavor was there. And now that a lot of people are playing Baldur's Gate 3, it's bringing people into Magic because they're like, oh, I can play that as my commander, that guy that's in my party? That's awesome. Um, but then earlier this year, they did a Lord of the Rings crossover. And oh my god, it was a success, smash hit. Now the reason I think this is so good is because, number one, we all love Lord of the Rings. If you love magic, you probably love Lord of the Rings. Also, if you're a human, you probably love Lord of the Rings. I don't want to meet the guy who doesn't. We're not going to be friends. What the fuck is wrong with you? Um, but they did the greatest stunt in magic history. We all know the One Ring from Lord of the Rings. They printed a serialized version of it, zero, one of zero, one. One serialized version of the One Ring, period. There will only ever be one, that's it. Originally, they said, someone said, I'll pay 500,000 if you open it. Then it went up to a million. Then it went up to 1.5 million. And then post Malone, the most famous magic player in the world, infamous, I mean, like, he's synonymous with the game now, paid $2.5 million for the one ring card. Incredible, incredible. I mean, it, the Lord of the Rings expansion, if you know nothing about magic, go buy some of that, set down, get a couple of the commander decks, and you'll have one of the best times of your life just learning to play magic. Magic is my favorite game of all time. I literally play it on, on the daily for 30 years. Like, I eat, sleep, and breathe that game. Please get into it, try it out. But if you're into Doctor Who, any Doctor Who fans, and I mean deep cut Doctor Who too, 11th Doctor, 10th Doctor, but first Doctor, second Doctor, they are doing a Doctor Who expansion later this year, and it looks like it's gonna be one of the most incredible things they've ever done. So, I, every time I do this thing, every time I do anything, I say play Magic the Gathering. If you're not playing Magic the Gathering, you are missing out on one of the best times of your life. It's a great game, it's a great role system, it's fantastic, but here's the biggest thing, and I, I love this part of Magic the Gathering. There are local gaming stores, there's 20 in Dallas, I looked. There are local gaming stores in every city, in every small town in this country. If you have a Magic the Gathering deck on you, you can walk into any single one of those stores, sit down and make a friend. All for the price of 100 Magic cards. You learn that game system, you sit down, and no matter where you are in the world, you can sit down and make a friend, and that is worth any amount of money to me. And I hope you give it a shot. It's my favorite game in the world. As always, it's my buy time. I'm going to make a ring for Pat. As always, guys, thanks for watching. I love you very much. And I'll speak with you again soon. Now go fuck yourselves.